So good afternoon and welcome to all of you. My name is Nick Austin. I'm the Master of Campion Hall at the University of Oxford. And it's my pleasure this evening to uh, welcome you all to this happy occasion of the book launch of Theological Ethics Through a Multi-Species Lens by Celia Dean Drummond. This is the first in her trilogy on the evolution of wisdom. We're very delighted to uh, be able to present to you our three panelists this evening. So Professor Paul Fidesz, who's a senior research fellow and the principal emeritus of Regent's Park College at the University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Caroline Phillips, who is a departmental lecturer in paleoanthropology and a stipendiary lecturer in biological science at St. Hugh's College, also at the University of Oxford and Professor Alistair McGrath, who's the Andreas Idrios Professor of Science and Religion at Oxford as well. Just a few uh, brief uh, housekeeping announcements. We'll go for one hour. Um, the programme will be uh, a response to the book by each of the panellists, and uh, then there'll be a brief panel discussion. And at the end, there'll be opportunity for questions. So if you see your screen, there's an ask a question function. You can type in your questions there. And you can also mark if you uh, agree with a question, then that will uh, put it up the list and make it more likely to be asked. Uh, the event will be simultaneously broadcast on YouTube on the Campion Halls page and will be available as a video afterwards if you'd like to rewatch. So now uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Paul Fidders. Paul, over to you and to your response to theological ethics through a multi-species lens. Well, thank you to the Laudato Sea Institute and to Celia for allowing me to make a response. I found this book to be an exciting read the academic equivalent of a page turner. In this original, imaginative, well-documented account, the author takes us with her in exploring the origin of our moral life in evolutionary biology and in setting the human project of being moral agents in the context of our relation with all animals. Convincingly, I think, she advances a community-based, multi-species approach to ethics. My own brief response here is going to be that of a theologian. I'll leave the science to others. And I've been particularly intrigued by the way that she weaves the theological idea of wisdom through the whole account. This is nothing less than the story of the evolution of wisdom which brings along with it the basic virtues of justice and compassion. Making my focus even narrower, I want to comment on what for me has become the hinge on which the whole argument seems to turn as I've read and reflected on the volume. I mean the author's account of the development of providentia or foresight in chapter four. And from that point, I want then to make a few wider observations. In chapter four, the author is concerned to trace the emergence of practical wisdom or the capacity for complex decision-making in the evolutionary story. I'll leave here on one side her argument that evolution is best understood in terms of the development of systems rather than natural selection on its own. From the treatment of practical wisdom, prudentia, by Thomas Aquinas, the author derives the argument that key among the characteristics of wisdom is foresight or providentia, the ability to imagine alternative outcomes. While something analogous to practical wisdom or prudence can be observed among all social animals, she thinks, the element of foresight, supported by memory, appears to have emerged among early hominins 
as essential for early human survival. Such providentia she envisages as arising earlier than language making or the development of any fixed rules or codes of conduct, but later than the exercise of compassion. Providentia, characteristic of homo prospectus, is a capacity to judge between good ends in interaction with others, and so is the basis for justice. Now in the author's account, wisdom as providentia becomes the pivotal point, not only for the emergence of a moral sense, but for a relationship of created beings to God. And this is where the author's argument becomes fascinating for me as a theologian. She suggests that the human capacity for foresight for providentia is linked with divine providence and has something of the character of the divine in us. That's what she says. She then goes on to affirm that the cognitive capacity for conscious belief in God may evolve, but receptive experience of God is primary and one that promotes rather than inhibits human flourishing. So the conclusion is that providentia is an area in human consciousness which is open to the divine, which in turn is experienced as a transcendent providentia, or as we're accustomed to say, the providence of God. The experience of that other, she writes, gradually dawned, providing foresight with a sense of divine providence. The human form of providentia is thus aligned in some way to what she calls receptivity to the divine. The human ability to prospect into the future could even, she thinks, have been fostered by the religious experience. The author develops this argument in dialogue with Aquinas, for whom practical wisdom, she writes, can be received by grace as well as acquired by understanding, and for whom prospective prudence is driven by love, which is ultimately a love orientated to divine love. However, in maintaining, surely rightly, that this attunement of human foresight to divine providence only makes evolutionary sense if divine providence is not fixed and deterministic, but is itself open to contingency, she seems to me to go just a degree or two beyond Aquinas, despite her appeal to him. Now, along with my appreciation for this insight into the key place occupied by the element of foresight in wisdom, I suggest that the author could perhaps make some further connections in her own argument, or at least I'd like to know what she makes of connections I myself would venture to make. She relies quite heavily on the account by Norman Habel of wisdom in the Hebraic tradition, identifying four elements, careful observation of the world, discernment of the way or place of particular phenomena, the gradual process of acquiring wisdom, and the idea that everything has its own driving force or its way, Derek. Wisdom itself then is a way. What I miss in Habel's useful account is that wisdom is not just to be acquired like a precious object, but participated in. Alongside careful observation of the phenomena of the world and their ways is learning to engage with the way or the flow of wisdom, which is embodied in the currents of life in the whole of creation. In Hebrew wisdom, this is depicted imaginatively as walking with woman wisdom, who's constantly moving along the thoroughfares of the world 
and who is nothing less than an extension of God's own being. Wisdom in the Hebrew tradition is both observation, or what we might call practical wisdom, and participation, which in Christian tradition was called Sophia, blending wisdom with love. Since wisdom is finally God's own practical wisdom, learning to engage in the flow of life, whether human or multi-species, is actually being immersed into the complex movement of God's own life, which in Christian tradition is symbolized as the Trinity. This symbol isn't a mathematical puzzle, but the imagining of interweaving currents of life and love which are inexhaustible and always offer more to those who engage in them. Now, coming at the author's text from this theological perspective, I find the notion of participation to be a clue to the way that human providentia aligns the word with divine providentia. I can also find connections between her chapter on the development of compassion and empathy in the evolutionary story, chapter three, and her chapter four on becoming wise. Surely the capacity to empathize is precisely the capacity to participate in the life of others. I would then value the author's thought about the actual relation between empathy and wisdom in the evolutionary story, beyond her judgment that historically the one precedes the other. The development of imagination by pictorial man seems a significant link, as do the effective and intuitive aspects of wisdom. Now, in terms of strategy, the author explains that she's intending to hold theological aspects of her discussion in the background during this volume, except, she says, where it's particularly helpful for the argument. She evidently feels that she must break theological cover with this proposed intersection between human and divine providentia, because she argues that openness to the divine, whether it's unconscious or conscious, may actually foster the human development of wisdom, and so is part of the explanatory story. She may judge then that locating sapiential participation in the Trinitarian life of God is a step too far at this stage because she is reserving a full discussion of theological wisdom until volume three. However, she does appeal in chapter nine of this volume to the image of the Trinity to defend the claim that animals are in a sense persons. So it seems to me that a reference to Trinity envisaging this participation in a God whose being is somehow relational, dynamic and complex at the hinge of human and divine providentia might be one of those occasions which, as she says, is particularly helpful to the argument. Well, I look forward to her reaction and meanwhile repeat my admiration for what is, I think, a groundbreaking book. Thank you very much, Paul, for that very theological engagement with Celia's argument especially on the participation in God's wisdom. Uh, Dr. Caroline Phillips, Caroline, can I now hand over to you for your response? Thank you so much. And thank you, Celia, also for uh, inviting me today. Um, I would like to, to say, I'm sure for all of us, uh, but uh, for Celia, um, uh, for all of us, and as she acknowledges in her book, any journey that we take into understanding the evolution of wisdom, I'm sure we all appreciate is, is no mean feat at all. And I think in her book, rather than provide explicit resolutions on how to achieve this, um, what she does is she takes a graceful, honest and open approach by inviting anthropologists and theologists and evolutionary biologists, psychologists, just to name a few, to join her in her own exploration. The chapters in her in her book, uh, 
evaluate views of workers across disciplines on morality, compassion, justice, practical wisdom, personhood in humans, and of course through a multi-species lens as cross human taxa, non-human taxa rather. I'm most impressed with her synthesis and balanced argument provided on contemporary views of evolution, particularly gene cultural co-evolution, niche construction and transgener transgenerational epigenetics and their potential marrying with theology ethics. As a primatologist slash biological anthropologist, uh, who's admitting I'm lost in the utter wonder of our close relatives, non-human primates, and who very much uses the lens that we are primates. My training and personal philosophy is to take a broad and devolutionary perspective to explore origins of traits across order, the order primates and our own lineage. So work that's, that's uh, referred to, such as Franz de Waal, for example, sits very comfortably and uh, in taking the view perhaps that behaviours across primates and how we can explore possible avenues of parsimony that may explain the origins of traits in humans and our ancestors, as I say, sits very comfortably. For some, this is too reductionist and unsatisfying, and in parts, uh, Celia argues why, in her view, such an approach is limiting, particularly in chapters three and four, as she explores morality, empathy, compassion, and practical wisdom, and their expression in humans and non-human taxa. I wish to con convey here for workers who may take a similar approach and view uh, to me, that we do acknowledge these limitations. But I think also we very much explore the foundation of some traits, certain traits, including some I've lined in this book across extant primates to try and understand how early our earliest hominin ancestors, our last common ancestor at the split of our lineage, the chimpanzees and bonobos, eight to 10 million years ago, perhaps even sister taxon of our last common ancestor in exploring how they live and what they might tell us about traits that, and how they've originated. So I'd be really interested to hear uh, Celia's views on what she too envisages for other genera in our lineage in her exploration. Using extant non-human primates as modern analogues to model aspects of human evolution and perhaps seeking relationships between uh, non-human primates and humans uh, by some is certainly viewed as over, over, oversimplified and um, as argued on page 99. Um, I'd say very much, you know, Celia very much acknowledges such efforts though and uh, workers them, and makes clear that workers themselves are not claiming to have all the answers. Celia does express some reservations of these uh, various approaches made by, by some biological and evolutionary anthropologists in their plight to understand the evolution of humans. But what I love about this book is that it, it, she clearly conveys just how open she is to sharing some of their views and explains how this drives much of her questioning as well. I think in terms of acknowledging that humans are unique, I think everybody here can would certainly acknowledge that. I think as well, it's wonderful in her book in exploring the fact that other species are also unique in themselves. I think she sums this up beautifully on page 98 in her discussion of the evolution of practical wisdom across taxa, and recognising that many other animals have remarkable degrees of social complexity and perhaps form wisdom distinctive to their particular social and ecolo ecological niche. I really love that. So I, I would also agree that... Um, the approaches taken to understand aspects of our evolution uh, are oversimplified. Um, but we, we, you know, it's a challenge of understanding what is unknowable. We have so much that's unknowable, so, so working around that is, um, is the challenge. But I think uh, we likely miss many insights into the remarkable degrees of complexity in extant an animals, simply because as much as we study and perhaps feel that we can relate to them, we will never be them. And I think that's the point that Celia graciously examines in her book across some of the chapters. I'm going to jump to uh, the end of her book now, to chapter nine, because it's certainly opened up a new world for me in the debate of exclusion and on personhood. In terms of her account on the uh, hypotheses presented by Berger and Hawks, Hawks on uh, possible burial by Homer and Naledi, it's an impressive account and I would 
So I think uh, Caroline's internet may be a little bit uh, weak at the moment. So we'll just wait a, a few moments to see if she can reconnect. And if not, we'll, uh, we'll move to Alistair and hope she can rejoin us a bit later. Okay, well, it, it doesn't look as though Caroline's rejoining us immediately. Hopefully, she will be able to soon. So perhaps I can hand over to Professor Alistair McGrath. Alistair, would you like to um, offer your response to Celia? Oh, I'm very pleased to do so. And I'm speaking really from the perspective of science and religion. And I want to begin by saying I'm very grateful to Professor Dean Drummond for developing such a comprehensive vision of how theology might be integrated or at least brought into dialogue with some basic themes of an evolutionary understanding of our world. And I think it's particularly important that she opens up the question of the role of other species in helping us to understand both our, our place in the world and also, I think, how to engage the multiple possibilities that face us. And I, I, I especially welcome her emphasis over the last decade, really, on the importance of engaging theologically with these themes, using such persuasive and, I think, interesting dialogue partners as Hans Urs von Balthasar and Thomas Aquinas. So I think there's a lot of wisdom, if I put like that, in this book. I think I sense a vision here that, uh, at least in terms of its scope, is comparable in some ways to that of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, while, of course, maintaining a much closer, I think, a more realistic connection with some of the core themes of Christian theology. And I have to say, I particularly welcome her emphasis on the incarnation and the very important coordinating role she assigns to a, a theodrama. drama. I think that was very very interesting, and I find all of that to be very rich and suggestive, raising lots of interesting questions for further discussion about, about both points of detail and its overall vision. Now, Professor Dean Drummond is rooted in two disciplines, the biological sciences and theology. I think she offers us here much food for thought about where this interdisciplinary dialogue might actually take us in the future, as well, of course, as to what additional uh, dialogues might be developed. And I there's a real challenge here to think about this because I do think we need to reflect on how we rise to this um, this challenge of disciplinary fragmentation. Because for me, one of the most noticeable and worrying features of modern academic life is a trend towards the fragmentation of disciplines, which is often accompanied by, I think, a more general sense of disciplinary isolation in which scholars embedded in one specific field of studies find themselves feeling disengaged from a wider academic culture. And I've often heard, as I'm sure many of you have as well, that um, academics speak of feeling they're working in a disciplinary silo or intellectual ghetto, which is disconnected from other fields of academic endeavor. And the causes of this on these are complex, and they include, I think, the proliferation of very um, substantial research literatures, which are increasingly difficult to master, even within a single field of study. But I think that we just have to, to realize that this kind of interdisciplinarity has to be encouraged. And I very much welcome Professor Dean Drummond's most recent work and the trajectory of thought which it represents, both for what it has achieved, but also, I think, for what it promises. Now, I don't in any way criticize those who choose to master a single discipline, because I think we need their depth of knowledge. But I think interdisciplinarity offers us a breadth the vision which enables us to make connections and see a larger picture and it builds on the renaissance vision of communal interdisciplinarity in which scholars writers and artists from multiple disciplines would gather in the gardens of their wealthy patrons to discuss the great questions of life and i think that's a very important model for us here that actually sharing wisdom across boundaries is very much to be welcomed so from what i've said it's very very clear i welcome this breadth of engagement and i welcome the possibilities that it raises and as oxford's professor of science and religion i'd be the first to recognize the diffuse and rather vague nature of this specific research field so often seem to me to be like a chessboard with each space representing a possible interaction of some aspect of science with some aspect of religion i have to admit that some of those spaces on that chessboard might attract little interest, but others are richly populated. I think above all, those that try to engage a specific science with a sp 
specific theological tradition. And that, I think, is what we find in Professor Dean Drummond's work, which we're discussing tonight. So I think you'll have gathered that I welcome this book and find much here to welcome and to talk about. But I need to open up the discussion. I think I will do this by raising some questions that seem to me to arise in this approach, and especially from its discussion of wisdom. I'll make clear I'm not criticizing Professor Dean Drummond at all. I'm simply saying here are some questions that occur to me as I reflect on this book, which I think you know we can open up for wider discussion. Now, this book does not adopt the approach that we find in Edward Wilson's book, Consilience, because here we find human knowledge biologized, in other words, seen as a product that is controlled by biology. And Professor Dean Drummond offers us an approach that is informed by both theology and biology, but I think it's an invitation to interdisciplinary dialogue rather than an assertion of disciplinary control. But Wilson actually, in that book, Consilience, makes a further point, which I think is merit, and which opens up a very, very helpful conversation in relation to the book we're talking about tonight. And here is a, a one-liner from that book, which I think is very, very good. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. Now, I think we can get a good sense of what Wilson means by wisdom from what he says in this book. But my point is, it's not really an empirical notion. Wisdom isn't something that we can determine or define empirically, even though I think we could offer a range of empirical placeholders for this cultural notion. And it seems to me to be a consensus in the empirical literature that wisdom could be considered to be uniquely human, driven by experience, it's measurable and it's learned, and it increases with age. But what I wonder are the measures of wisdom that we're using here. Are we simply actually reinforcing existing cultural preconceptions of what wisdom ought to be? And this is where I think I find myself struggling a little bit. In, in the wisdom is not about what Wilson calls information, but it's more about something that's assimilated and interpreted. And like David Hume, I find myself struggling and trying to transition from observing the natural realm to asking how I should think and act within that realm. And I very often find myself pursuing a virtue that yeah, I don't believe can be established in a kind of way given substance science Typically, you know, how can I know I am acting wisely? Or more controversially, can I see that another species has acted wisely in a given situation? Now, ultimately, I can see ways around this. Uh, for example, from a Christian perspective, we might hold that Christ is the embodiment of wisdom, and we might use that to open up our reflections. And while I suppose some might think this is a kind of disciplinary imperialism, it seems to me to be more a matter of Recognizing that since natural sciences can actually tell us what wisdom is, we are free to draw on other traditions of wisdom and see how these might play out at a scientific level and inform our discussion. And we can also, I think, reflect on patterns of behavior in the natural world that might inform our own thinking. But this, this raises, I think, uh, an awkward question for me, and maybe for others as well, which I think I see illustrated in Thomas H. Huxley's very famous Romana's lecture of 1893, actually, given here in Oxford in the Sheldonian Theatre. And this lecture was entitled Evolution and Ethics. And it suggests that humanity might have triumphed on account of certain violent and aggressive instincts, but that these now need to be subjugated and transformed with the emergence of civilization. In other words, our evolutionary history might not help us develop our ethics when we are thinking about wisdom. If anything, it might show us what we need to leave behind us. And at that point, I wondered if Professor Dean Drummond might see any parallel line of wisdom or discussion actually relating to wisdom itself. But there's one point I want to make in closing, and this is another issue which I find difficult, and I think it might be interesting to talk about. When I read philosophers who reflect on wisdom and the role of the wise, I very often find myself wondering whether wisdom is being sub defined in terms of the, the views of sociologically determinative or privileged groups, the wise. And for example, Aristotle sometimes seems to assume that the views of certain social groups or significant individuals are deemed to be privileged and thus allowed to define what is wise and not merely knowledgeable. And here's my point. It's almost as if we need someone or something from outside 
to help us avoid this entrapment. One answer, of course, might be incarnation. But there's another way being not asked to talk about, which might be reflection on human interactions with other species. And I think that's another reason to be very grateful to Professor Dean Drummond for opening up this such important conversation. And I'm so glad she's written this book. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Alistair, for those, those comments. Um, Celia, would you like now to uh, respond to all three uh, presenters? Although we didn't hear everything that Caroline had to say, I think um, you, you probably had some notes in advance. So perhaps you can speak to the all three uh, presenters and their comments on your on your book. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank everyone for for coming tonight, but also particularly for the the three presenters today for taking the trouble to read it, read my book so carefully and interact with it. Um, that's the the greatest honour any author can can give anyone, any author, is to read it. <laughs> so, um, but I want to sort of start off by saying what inspired this book, um, and in a sense, uh, there was a deliberate reason why the cover is the way it is. Um, this orangutan is intended to be provocative. It's intended to stress this idea of encounter, encounter between us and the wild, but also the encounter with the, with the domestic, which you'll see in the cover sleeve, there's a picture of a dog and she's called Dara. And Dara means full of compassion in Hebrew for those who don't speak Hebrew. And the reason why um, this book took the shape it did was largely because of her, because um, she lived just for three years. And in the, the course of her short life, I understood an awful lot more about what it means to, to have compassion in true to her name. But also she very sadly and tragically died the day we landed in England in uh, June 2017, after um, six years after living in the USA. And that story is also woven into this book. And it informed my background consciousness to the way the book, the shape the book took. But it was also informed by a publication of Laudato Si, which is Pope Francis's encyclical published in 2015, where he talks about the entanglement between us and other beings. And he provoked in me a, a development of a different kind of thinking through ethics in particular, a multi-species approach rather than a strictly anthropocentric one, a move, if you will, but from a philosophy of personalism towards a, kind, a naturalism, but without losing a sense of the transcendent in the way that all uh, three, three respondents have, have picked up. But important to me also was the um, thinking of anthropologist Tim Ingold, whose ideas on threads and lines with um, amazingly original thinking in conversation with indigenous communities sparked off a different understanding or perspective on what it is to be an other creature, in particular their sense of subjectivity in relation to us so that we're not just on our own, we are with in this community of subjects. And that again reflects a change in my own thinking. In addition, I engage with Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach and Paul Recur on his phenomenology of the just. Um, and so all of these people really are interlocutors important to me alongside, of course, Augustin Fuentes, who was extremely influential in practical terms more about what I'm going to say. Well, I'm going to say more about his work in a moment. But first of all, specifically um, to Paul Fiddis, I don't know how to thank you enough for, in a sense, um, not only reading my work carefully, but bringing in insights I only barely understood myself in writing this book. And I think you're right that the core marker in here in traveling this book forward towards the next stage is this marker of foresight. Um, linked in with uh, divine providence. The Trinity, yes, I'm conscious all the way through of I was restraining myself to a degree and not talking about the Trinity. And I did that because I want this to be open to all faiths and none. And it was a limitation theologically, but it was a compromise 
in another way in order to open this up a little bit further. I could perhaps have done that and maybe I should in another, another article. And you're right, the kind of participation that you speak of is exactly where I, my thinking is going on this. And I do intend by volume three to become more explicit in that respect, because by the time I get to volume three, I'm talking about the life of the spirit. And it's impossible really to talk about that without bringing in uh, the Trinity or Trinitarian thinking. Whereas volume two is about more uh, reflective of Christology, deep incarnation, but also um, an understanding of evil, suffering and death. And again, it's impossible to avoid a discussion of, of Christ in that context. So uh, it's not a fully systematic book. It is intended as an ethical book. But at the same time, there are therefore structural limitations um, that I take on board. And I will in due time, I hope, when I've had a time to think through the next two volumes, be ready to take it a little bit further. To Caroline Phillips, I know she's not here, but anyway, thank you. And this will be recorded. So I want to thank her for understanding really my attention to alloprimates. Um, and I take off my hat here, not just to people like her, but also Augustin Fuentes, who introduced me to his work on macaques and other primates um, in uh, what he understood as um, prime primato eth ethnographic work. So in other words, using the tools of anthropology to understand the way humans and other animals interact and intersect. Uh, Mark Beckoff as well was extremely influential in my thinking. I write a little bit about his work with wolves and canids. Um, Marcus Baines Rock, his fascinating work with hyenas, and we had the privilege of having him as one of our postdoctoral fellows in a research project on the evolution of wisdom. So this work on wisdom has been uh, bubbling along for, for some years with a number of different publications I'm not going to go into today. But um, it reflects, if you like, the culmination of that thinking. And um, in relation to uh, Homo Naledi um, as well, which uh, Caroline was going to mention, only she was cut sh rather short, this particular coexistence of Homo Naledi and Homo sapiens is fascinating to me because many evolutionary um, anthropologists believe that has been some cross species inter or, or cross subspecies interaction between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalis. That is, we all share a percent, percent of, of their DNA. So the idea that there was some kind of social or maybe even more than social exchange is fairly likely. So there isn't really a presupposition necessarily of violence um, in, in terms of why it is that we are the only hominin left standing. And then with that to Alistair McGrath as well, I'm so grateful for, to him for being both a scientist and a theologian like me. And the important comments that he raises, many of which, of course, we've struggled with as we've thought through the, the evolution of wisdom and what kind of proxies we can we can hold uh, in that process. So um, so what, what, what should we look at um, in the evolution of wisdom? And you should, um, I hope now, be able to see, oh, I wonder whether you can see it. Can you see the next slide here um, or not? Um, it looks like it's not playing. No. Um, so the next, I wonder why this isn't showing up, Tim, <laughs> to help, but um, well, maybe I should go out of this. And, um, see, yeah, I'm just, um, just coming over, uh, I think you just need to go into the display mode uh, at the bottom of your PowerPoint yeah. document to make it large. Hopefully that will click through. I have actually done that and it's not um, doing it. I think I'm going to have to cut this out again and then I'm going to try and share a screen share again. So what's going on here seems to be rather, rather a mess. Um, I'm just going to try it once more and I don't want to use up too much time. Application window, here we are. It's okay. 
So here we are. Yeah, this is the next slide um, that you should see. Um, the evolution of wisdom, semios, I've called it, we called it semiosis in the Pleistocene, was an article that was published in Cambridge Archaeology that came out of this book. To some degree, Alistair's right. We weren't, were we looking at wisdom or was it something else? Well, we weren't always sure ourselves, but the wisdom acted like a heuristic tool to enable, enable us to ask provocative questions that then led to more research. And that, to me, was actually the interplay of wisdom. We didn't necessarily know we were looking at the kind of wisdom that is characteristic of human communities in, in a sophisticated kind of way. But something about this tackling of wisdom in this context allowed us to ask different kinds of questions. And we defined it as the pattern and ability of successful complex decision making, navigating social networks and dynamic niches in human communities. Um, and Mark Kissel came up with this brilliant idea of worldwide instances of sy symbolic data outlining modernity wisdom uh, in order to get that language in articles, in secular articles, which were quite suspicious of even the, using the language of wisdom. Um, so that's why his article in the end ended up talking about semiosis. And here's, a, here's another slide that I'm going to come to um, in a minute. Um, um, but the, the, the point is that um, though what we were looking for is fragments of wisdom, which I emphasise in this particular book, but we were also finding that there were fragmented abilities to have something that was went, seemed to go beyond um, the uh, purely practical way back in human history, far earlier than this um, an anatomically modern humans that you see here, AAMH. That was generally thought to be the, the turning point when Homo sapiens started to, to become able to do sophisticated symbolic thought. But these, all these other things happened a lot earlier, and that, didn't re that wouldn't have really been discovered if we hadn't had this wisdom project. So it was a practical usefulness of using this language of wisdom, even if um, we weren't always sure whether what fragments we were getting were fully um, congruent with the kind of wisdom that we might be able to define or even not be able to define because wisdom like Alistair has suggested is beyond definition. But I also think that wisdom is a is a connector capacity and allows us to think more further about what justice requires or in uh, in pre um, human terms inequity aversion. Um, but it also uh, is uh, feeds into what our compassion might require as well. So what does what it might look like in uh, to show empathy? What does that actually mean? Uh, wisdom helps us to understand that. Um, uh, Penny Spikens' work on compassion uh, shows that it goes back way back into into our deep into deep time into the Neanderthals and beyond and she's very generously also in on this call so if she wants to ask a question we'm sure we can get to that um, but it but wisdom does um, confer advantages evolutionary advantages it allows us to think about the big picture rather than um, rather than uh, smaller picture ideas and I think that is very different from information which is probably one of the reasons why so many scientists as well have recognized that information alone is not really enough um, so um, and the narrower we define wisdom the easy the the more likely it is that it'll become confined to humanity so the, the broader definitions and the looser the definitions allow us to explore things in a slightly different way. I also think... See, yes. if, you, if you could uh, wrap up your yeah. comments in a minute or so, okay. then we can... Okay, so my uh, last... Uh, my la I'm just coming to my last comment. And that's really the sort of throwaway line from Alistair at the end of his um, very helpful input. Um, that uh, he sort of hinted at um, morality might be, um, if you like, um, an over encompassing, have an over encompassing role in order to control our more brutal or brutish tendencies. And I, I think really what I'm trying to do in this book is to show that it was much more complicated than that. Yes, we have those negative tendencies, but our ability to show justice, compassion and wisdom are also in some sense reflected in other species as well. And when we come to the second volume where I talk about the darker side of human nature, 
we can see then how there are lines of discontinuity and continuity. We are both the most, com we have the ability as you, the human species to be the most compassionate, but we also have the, the ability to be the most cruel as well. So both aspects are exaggerated. So we shouldn't sort of think of other animals as, the, as, as uh, responsible in some sense. Um, we have been given these special responsibilities. And with that, I'm going to close because I know that I'd far rather hear what um, questions that people have rather than listening to myself. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And over to you, um, Nick. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Celia, for those uh, responses. So just before we, we go over to the question and answer, and please do put your questions in the ask a question. Uh, you should be able to find the tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, just to, to go back to um, to Paul and Alistair, having heard um, Celia's response, uh, is there anything else that, that you've heard in that discussion? Um, oh, Caroline, welcome back. We're sorry we lost you due to technical problems, but uh, Celia explained a few things that you were going to say and tried to respond to them also. Um, so would anyone like to respond to anything you you've heard um paul you raised the question of um trinitarian theology and how this could provide a more encompassing lens through which to see these things and uh, alistair you were talking about um interdisciplinary dialogue and the challenges and values of that and also the the difficulty of knowing when one is wise without lapsing into a sort of failure in epistemic humility or uh, an undue claim to privilege, to being part of a privileged group that knows. Um, anything you wanted to respond to or Caroline from what you heard from the other panelists? Paul, if you'd like to uh, are you inviting yes yeah, sure a yeah. comeback oh, yeah. <laughs> no i just wanted to say that it's not that as a christian theologian i want to as it were drag in the trinity at every opportunity um it's rather that it's, it's explanatory value really um what i suppose I, i'm asking is is it possible to think about this um um, re receptivity of God in terms of receptivity of a complex God, a God in whom there are movements of love and justice and compassion, whether or not we give this the name of, of, of Trinity. After all, Hebrewism is dealing with a very complex concept of God, a God in whom there is not only um, uh, spirit but wisdom and word. Uh, so, um, and I was very taken by the analogy of um, uh, of Alistair about a chessboard, you know, where he said that at any point in the game, as it were, you can make a move and have a response from the other side, as it were. The question is where you begin to make those moves in terms of theology and religion. And that was really the question I was raising about strategy, you know, at what points, as it were, one is compelled to say something from a theological point of view. And I felt that Celia was doing that. Uh, she said herself, you know that it's necessary at some for the argument so i was really simply raising the question if we get to talk about receptivity of god and participation in god even in the most general sense um, um could this not be in terms of engagement in a, in a god in whom there is complexity of life and being okay thanks yeah. thanks paul I, I see we're um uh, getting a bit pushed for time if we want to hear from some of the questions that have been posed so I propose we, we move to the question and answer and I invite any of the panelists to reply. So we have a question from Emily. How do you understand the relationship and the differences between the moral status of humans and non-human animals? And how does the doctrine of Imago Dei fit into your view? So the relationship and differences between humans and non-humans in their moral status and the relevance of the Imago Dei doctrine to understanding that. I, th I guess that's addressed to me, is it? Um, um, yes, um, well, I think this is a very good question. Um, and 
I actually wrote a book before this called The Wisdom of the Liminal Evolution and Other Animals in Human Becoming, where I, I talk about the Imago Dei in that um, and what's distinctive about humans um, in relation to other animals. I don't think we can have, even in a multi-species approach, we can't altogether avoid this question of human distinctiveness. And I think that what I was trying to argue in this multi-species approach that Yes, we are distinct, but we are distinct with others in a particular way, just as each and every other creature is distinct in their own particular way. But the particular responsibility that we have as as humans is to be moral agents in a way that's also distinct. I know that's slightly convoluted as an argument, but um, I'm trying to complexify this idea of them and us, which um, tends to be the case if we go for what's called human exceptionalism as a basic for, basis for the moral life or sometimes personalism. Um, I'm trying to complexify that by seeing ourselves as more richly situated and embedded, but I certainly don't deny the idea of Margot Day or human dignity, is, which is a broader way of understanding it from a, um, a secular point of view. So I hope that's helpful. Good, thanks, Celia. And I think you bring out in your book very well the sort of danger of a sort of undue anxiety about conceding to animals, especially primates, qualities we'd normally have previously reserved to human beings, as though somehow by acknowledging those in, in non-human animals, we're going to diminish the um, sacredness of the human person. Um, so you steer your way through all of those rather complex issues rather well. We have a question from Laura Rival. Um, how do you envisage the relationship between love and wisdom? Uh, one of those uh, big questions, I would say. Uh, Celia or anyone else, would you like to comment on, on that question? Oh, gosh. I mean, this is one of the most complex um, questions there is. And in a sense, you know, each of the each of the volumes as I go through is coming back to some some of that, um, and I think the, um, the the way I see it at least is um, just as wisdom has different levels, there's practical wisdom, but there's also wisdom proper in terms of virtue. So there's um, there's compassion, but then there's also charity. So there are so many different dimensions to both love and wisdom. How we understand those relationships will depend on which particular aspect of love and wisdom that we're talking about and then how those two are connected and interrelated but i would say that they're sort of mutually um informing um it's, so it's partially a, a circular argument so love informs wisdom and wisdom informs love so the two are um like in a dance together and rather like um for fitters is helpful understanding of, of uh, participation. I think those two participate in one another as well in a in a way that informs the moral life. So you can't realistically have true wisdom without love and vice versa. So I know that's not quite an answer you may want. Um, it's not as clear as it could be, but I hope it gives a starting point. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, Oliver Putz has a question here. It's, uh, you can, perhaps you can read it in the comments. Perhaps just to summarize, uh, at the end he says that chimps are showing foresight not only in using making tools, but also in certain future-oriented behaviors. So in these signatures of wisdom, including foresight, how do you draw the line between humans and animals? And given what you've just said, is drawing the line the point, I guess? Yeah, I'm not sure that there is a point in drawing the line. Um, I mean, there is a point in this in as much as if you had to make a decision or an ethical decision. So I don't think you can completely avoid hierarchy. So, I mean, a Buddhist approach to compassion would be to say if you squash an ant, that's, you know, a tragedy, almost the same as killing anything. I think that I think in practical terms, it's very difficult to live like that. So to a degree, we have to make some distinctions. But but foresight, I would, I think I would say that if you actually look at what chimps are doing, I'm not sure I'd want to call it foresight. I would, I would call it maybe something slightly different or a modified version of it, rather like you say is a, a modified version of prudence. So there's a prudence of a sort. So it's foresight of a sort, and it certainly doesn't have the distinctive marks of the kind of memory 
and imagination that humans are capable of that are able to see way into the future. Um, so there are hints at it, but it's not the same, just as there are hints at memory, but it's not the same in other beings. And I think we have an awful lot to learn from other animals, including chimps. And I'm very much in sympathy with responding to and seeing it from within their own worlds rather than making them entirely coalescing with our, our world. So we have to respect them from within where, where within their own um, niche, their own um, purpose, if you will, because um, mm -hmm. um, they don't have the same kind of moral basis for thinking about the future that, that human communities do. Um, so there are important differences as well as similarities, I think. Okay, thanks, Hila. I just um, I'm just conscious that Caroline got uh, cut off a little bit prematurely there. So uh, perhaps before we finish, Caroline, is there anything you'd like to say that you didn't get? If you can summarise it rather briefly, anything you didn't get a chance to say in your in your talk? No, thank you. Uh, I just want to say uh, I think uh, what Cynthia uh, Celia is saying is is very uh, completely com concur in terms of perceptions from other animals, uh, at their viewpoints, and how we explore in terms of multi species communities. But I'd be really interested in her trilogy also. Uh, perhaps in volume two, as she's expressed, you know, given a summary in terms of thinking about thanatology um, across species as well, in terms of in the context of wisdom, if we are to explore these virtues in terms of compassion, empathy, their perception and uh, of other, uh, for example, of a chim in chimpanzees uh, or other primates in their community, their perception of um, the individual that's deceased, uh, and how we explore that. I think the big challenge is, is how we explore some of these traits in non-human taxa, very much from a perspective as a human, and in many contexts, very much in an environment that's been created by humans, if we're talking about studying in a captive environment. So I think we, I think Celia captures this very much in her book, and I just think it's a wonderful book in, in that respect. Yeah, thanks very much, Caroline. I think it's a tribute to what Celia's doing here that uh, she's equally engaging to theologians and those working in evolutionary primatology and anthropology and so on. So, uh, from my own perspective, my own discipline of theological ethics, I think it's a, it's a very valuable book. I, I focus especially on the virtues, and I think that putting the virtues in this evolutionary uh, perspective does give another mode of access, which actually, actually leads us to revise our understanding of the traditional virtues, as well as confirming something that we already knew about these virtues. But uh, it, it does bring in a, um, a new perspective. And the fact that Celia puts that all also in a theological perspective means that there's a real breadth of vision to her engagement with uh, virtue from a theological perspective, I think. So, uh, Celia, thank you very much for the book and for the discussion. Thank you especially to our panelists, Alistair, Paul and Caroline. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. And I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's question, but we've, uh, we've noted those and um, Celia can uh, reflect on those at her leisure and perhaps that can help inform her next two volumes in this very ambitious project on the evolution of wisdom. So uh, thank you all once again and have a very good evening or afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Okay.